how many times have you gone to open up your yogurt and just on the top you see this huge pool of yellowish green liquid. And I know that liquid kind of looks unattractive, but by the end of this video, I will have you stirring the liquid back into the yogurt to eat instead of draining it out. Let's get into it. Now, if you've watched any of my videos, you know I love to talk about food's structure. I've talked about the structure of ice cream, the structure of salad dressing. We've talked about bread. And the reason I always talk about structure is that usually the structure of the food dictates the taste and texture. And in the case of yogurt, the structure also sort of is what leads to this defect of the liquid pooling on top of the yogurt. So to see why there's sort of this mysterious liquid appearing, we have to first look at what yogurt structure is. Okay, so yogurt has a specialized structure called a gel. And a gel just means that there is, there is some type of network that is sort of trapping a certain amount of liquid. So a gel means it has like a large network that can sort of um, hide away or bind a liquid and immobilize it. And besides yogurt, a lot of other foods are gels. Think of things like jam, jello, and gummy bears. So a lot of foods have the same similar structure. They have a gel structure. And in yogurt, we make this gel by doing a fermentation. But what we start with is usually whole milk, low fat milk, or cream. And what these sort of initial materials look like, if we think about the structure, is we do have a lot of water, but this water phase is actually really important because it dissolves a lot of other things like whey protein is dissolved in this water phase, lactose and other sugars, as well as any salts present. So the water phase is actually pretty complex. And then if we have cream, there actually is a good amount of fat, which I have showed here in yellow and fat makes the yogurt uh, sort of much more creamier, or really like the taste of fat. And then lastly, one really important thing here is casein. And casein is another protein we find in milk, but it is not dissolved by the water phase. So casein kind of makes just a big glob or sphere of its own proteins. They sort of get all intertangled. And we call this a casein micelle. So you also see in cream or milk, we would have these casein micelles. These casein micelles actually have a negative charge. And that's how they sort of stay away from each other is similar charges repel each other. So with each casein micelle being negatively charged, they always stay far away from each other. Now, if we want to take, you know, our cream or our milk and make it into yogurt, we have to add two types of bacteria to do a fermentation. And typically the same two bacteria strains are always used. And you can see this on the ingredient statement. So it has Streptococcus thermophilus and Lactobacillus bulgaricus. And those two are almost always used together to ferment yogurt. And what these bacteria do is they actually eat the small sugars that are in our cream or our milk, and they produce a ton of acid. So they eat the sugars, but their waste is kind of a lot of acid. And if you have a little bit of a chemistry background, we usually call acid H+, or it's a hydrogen ion. It is positively charged, which really starts to change how the casein micelles are going to behave in the cream. Because remember, those casein micelles had a negative charge and that helped the micelles repel one another. But as more and more acid is being produced, more and more of those positive um, ions are being around, so there's more positive charge in the system, all of a sudden the positive and negative charges sort of balance out, which means the casein micelle is now neutrally charged. It has no net charge. Now, when a protein has no net charge, we actually have a special term for that, and we call it the isoelectric point because this is a really important point for the food. It's where a lot of coagulation and gelation happens. And that's because at the isoelectric point, the casein micelles, they're neutrally charged. So they no longer have that negative charge, which repelled one casein micelle from another. So when they're neutrally charged, 
all of a sudden the casing micelles sort of start to aggregate and they sort of come together and because there's no repulsion anymore. And as you add more and more casing micelles to sort of this aggregate, all of a sudden you're starting to form a network. And this network grows and grows until it sort of encompasses that water phase and, and the fat as well. It sort of immobilizes and traps the water and the fat. And once that protein network is big enough, we see it start to act like a solid and we would call this solid, solid yogurt. Now back to this mysterious liquid that appears at the top of your yogurt. So we know we have a casing network that is supposed to sort of trap the liquid and hold it in. The only problem with the casing network is it's, it's not strong enough to stand up to a lot of physical agitation. So if you've ever seen in a grocery store sort of like a worker, I guess, just tossing the yogurt onto the shelves or dumping yogurt containers into a bin, that's horrible for the casing network. It, it's not strong enough. The casing network will start to collapse. All the pores will collapse, which releases that liquid. So as we sort of physically abuse, sort of toss or drop our yogurt, every time this happens, you're sort of making the casing network release more and more the liquid because it's collapsing. It's just the network isn't strong enough. You may have even seen in these bigger multi-serving containers that maybe the first time you open it, there isn't any of that liquid sort of at the top. But if you come back, you know, the next day after you scooped some already out, you see all of a sudden all this liquid appears. And that's because when you sort of use your spoon to dig into the yogurt, you're rupturing that gel, you're sort of making the gel collapse. So when you put it back in the fridge, the, the liquid is sort of leaching out of that collapsed area of the gel, which is when you come back 24 hours later to eat your yogurt, all of a sudden you see a bunch of liquid has been released. And in the food science world, we have a term for this liquid being released from a gel and we call that cineresis. So this is, this happens with a lot of different gels. It's not just yogurt. So that liquid we sort of think is like this unattractive yellow color on top of our yogurt. It actually was in the yogurt the whole time. It was held within that gel network, but now we've started to collapse that network and the liquid is being released and it sort of pools together on the top of the yogurt. But like I said earlier, this liquid, it's mostly water, but it does dissolve a couple of important nutrients. And probably the one most people would be interested in is whey protein. So that liquid contains whey protein, which people at the grocery store pay a lot of money for. There's a whole section of dried whey protein powder. So whey protein that we see in the store is just this dried version of this liquid. So instead of, you know, forking out a lot of money to get it in this dry form, you can just stir this liquid back into your yogurt and get that whey protein for much cheaper of a price. Well, I hope I've convinced you that the yellow liquid on top of your yogurt deserves a second chance. And it's not any type of, you know, a sign of spoilage or a safety issue. It's just you sort of agitated the gel network and it ended up releasing some of that liquid. And this liquid has some good nutritional value to you. It is mostly water, but like I said, it does contain that whey protein, which a lot of people pay big money for. So go ahead and stir that liquid back in the yogurt next time instead of wasting it. All right, I'll talk to you next time.